spend as much time with your family as you can. Time goes by so fast. As we look at James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, James obviously is very practical, and I want to preface this by saying, this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, not James, the disciple that ran around with Peter and John. He became a leader in the early church, much like Peter. He reached out to the Jews, and he was a mighty man of God. He didn't do a lot of writing, but what he did was strong and very practical, and that's why we chose this book to work through. We will begin with verses 1 through 3. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members, that is the members of your body? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet, but you cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Thank you. So he begins by saying, why are there conflicts among you, brothers and sisters? He isn't talking to those outside the church, but he's talking to those inside. James accurately describes strife among Christians with terms like Wars and fights in the church. We're not on that slide yet. Just hold on, please. Often the battles that happen to among Christians are bitter and severe, my friends. For even in the church, we struggle with each other from time to time. Where's that coming from? I don't like the way she dresses. I don't like the way he greets me. The pastor never comes over to my house. He's never taken me out on his boat before, but he took somebody else. Oh, we've heard these things from different people in our church, and I want to tell you that it's not about you, my friends. It's about God. We are called to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. But no two believers who are both walking in the Spirit of God towards each other can live together with wars and fights among themselves. My friends, this is carnality in the church. When sin is in the church, there will be wars and fights and bitter battles among us. People leave churches over the most silly reasons. I don't mind if you leave for a good reason. And I don't mind if you leave because the Lord has called you away, my friends. Those are good reasons. But I hear some of the stupidest reasons why people leave church. Someone took my pew. Almost all who have such a critical and contentious attitude claim that they are prompted and supported by the Spirit of God. They see their self-righteousness, my friends, not their sin. James makes it clear that this contentious manner comes from our personal desires. The wars within us become the wars within others in our relationships. Yes, it starts here, and it overflows into other relationships within the body of Christ. It is self-evident that the Spirit of God does not create desire which issues an envying spirit. Next slide. Your desires for pleasure in verse 1, that war in your members... I kind of wanted to research this because the types of desires that lead to conflict are described for us. Covetousness leads to conflict. You lust and do not have. Anger and animosity lead to hatred and conflict, which is murder. Some of you don't think that isn't your wife. You've already committed adultery in your heart. You see, maybe we're not as self-righteous as we think we are. 
And if we would understand that through personal self-assessment, maybe we would be more patient with others. I don't think you heard me, so I'm going to say it again. Maybe if we took a personal inventory through personal self-assessment about ourselves, we would be more patient with others. Somebody say amen. amen. That is a strong message, my friend. Stop looking at your brother and your sister and fault-finding them when you can look at yourself and fault-find you. Trust me, you are not a completed project. You are not finished yet. But the more we look at other people, the less likely we are to see inside ourselves needed change. We need to change, my friends, for the church of God needs to be a sanctified church, a holy church. But it doesn't happen when we focus on the issues of other people. I've met people that have been married four and five times. Because wherever you go, that's where you are. And so they never fix the actual problem, but every time you talk to someone, and I have an aunt who's been married five times, it's always the other person's fault. But wait, you've been married five times, but it's always their fault. And it's that way in church. I've been to, I hear from people, I've been to all these different churches, but none of them have it right. They say, when you find the perfect church, don't go there because you'll ruin it. <laughs> because you're not perfect either. My job is not to knock you down a peg. My job is to help you to understand that your neighbor isn't perfect just like you. So let's show your neighbor a little bit of kindness and grace. The Bible says in verse 2, yet you don't have because you don't ask. The reason these desires exist among Christians is because they do not seek God for their needs. You don't ask. James reminds us here of the great power of prayer and why we may live unnecessarily as a spiritual pauper. We're poor simply because we don't pray. Or we don't ask when we pray. So I like this particular verse because it reminds me that I have not because I ask not. And in verse 3, you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So even though you do ask, you ask for yourself instead of interceding for others. After dealing with these problems of no prayer, now James addresses the problem of selfish prayer. Did you ever think of prayer as being selfish? But it can be. Listen to your prayer life, my friends. Believe me, out of the heart the mouth speaks. Maybe you don't use your mouth when you pray. That's fine, I understand. There's times for silent prayer. I believe in verbal prayer. I always, almost always, pray out loud. I want to hear myself pray. I want to hear my voice make utterances to praise God. I guess there's something about it that encourages me when I hear myself pray. It encourages me to keep going and not think about other things, to not get distracted so easily. Because like so many of us, we can get tired when we pray and we can let our mind wander about the day's events when we pray. But my friends, I'm telling you, when you get into a place of prayer or on your knees or whatever the posture is for you, you need to just let those words fly out. Because you need to hear them. You need to hear what your heart is saying. We must remember that the purpose of prayer is not to persuade a reluctant God to do our bidding. The purpose of prayer is to line our will with His. And in partnership with Him, to ask Him to accomplish His will through our life. The purpose of prayer is to have communion with God, to enjoy being in His presence. And I hope you do. 
We all need to pray more, and there's certainly no doubt about that. Let's look at verse 4 and 5, please. He says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy to God? Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy? The spirit of God that lives in you is jealous when you become worldly. I find that interesting. Growing up, I had a friend who was often jealous. He, it didn't take a, a lot for him to be jealous. He was jealous over a lot of different things. He was jealous over different people. He was jealous over the things they owned. He was uh, jealous over the, the, the relationships they had. He was just a very jealous person, my friends. Do you know that we serve a jealous God? Not in the same way as my friend who is insecure, but in a way that he wants all of you. God doesn't want to share you with the world, my friends. God doesn't want a piece of you. God wants all of you. God doesn't want part of your heart. He wants all of your heart. And so James knows that, and he says, you adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity to God? James recognizes that we cannot both be friends with the world system in rebellion against God and be friends with God at the same time. We live in a world system, my friends. We are caught up in a world system, but we don't have to be taken by its current. We are to live countercultural. We are to be a friend of God, which means we are not to be a friend of this world. Because when we are friends with this world, we become worldly. Because the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. We've moved on from that one, guys. The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit has a jealous yearning for the friendship with God. You see, the Spirit will convict the Christian who lives in compromise. Let me say that again. The Spirit who lives in us. Hates compromise. But do you hate compromise? You see, some of us are such big people pleasers, we just tell people what they want to hear just to get them out of our office. But when it comes right down to it, we think we know more than other people. We all struggle with pride in thinking we know more than others, but the truth of the matter is, are we listening to what they say? Because God wants us to be strong for him. But complacency has worked its way into the church. And so now we have changed. Guys, please go to my default slide. So now we have changed preaching the word of God and living with solid doctrine to saying, well, that's okay, and this is okay, and maybe that's okay for you, and any way you want it is fine. James agrees with the passage in the Old Testament that tells us God is a jealous God. Maybe you've never heard this before. It's in Deuteronomy 32, Deuteronomy 32, 21, Exodus 20, verse 5. Exodus 34, 14, Zechariah 8, 2. God is a jealous God. But not in a bad way, as a way in which he gave his son for you on the cross. And that came at a price, my friends. He has every right to have a righteous jealousy for you. And I don't blame him. Because he thinks you're that special. William Barclay says, the idea is that God loves men with such a passion that he cannot bear any other love within the hearts of a man. Next slide. Thank you. Think of the inner pain and torture inside the person who is betrayed by an unfaithful spouse who must reckon with the truth. I am unfaithful to them, but they are not unfaithful to me. For this is what the Spirit of God feels regarding 
the world-loving hearts. I am faithful, God says to my people, but they are not faithful to me. That hurts the heart of God. For God has done so much for us, my friends, that we have to continue to understand that we need to take and push our pride aside, for God is a jealous God. Verse 6, please. But he gives more grace, therefore he says, but God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy be turned to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. I like what Spurgeon says in the next slide. Nope, the next slide. Sin seeks to enter, grace shuts the door. Sin tries to get the mastery, but grace, which is stronger than sin, resists and will not permit it. Sin gets us down at times and puts its foot on our neck. Grace comes to the rescue. Sin comes up like Noah's flood, but grace rides over the tops of the mountains of the ark. Charles Spurgeon. Pride versus grace. I like Muhammad Ali. He was one of my favorite fighters. Do you remember him? I am the greatest, he would say. And he probably was, to be honest with you, certainly at that time. I think Joe Frazier beat him once. Some other people beat him, especially toward the end of his career. So it's reported that Muhammad Ali was in an airplane and he was sitting in his seat and traveling somewhere with his family and at that time the flight attendant came up to him and she said, sir, I need you to put on your seatbelt. And he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she looked at him and she said, Superman don't need no airplane either. <laughs> we struggle with grace and pride. God resists the proud, the Bible says in verse 6. At the same time, James reminds us that the grace only comes to the humble. Grace doesn't come to the proud. Grace and pride are eternal enemies. I think it's important that you understand that grace and pride are eternal enemies. One allows you to go to heaven, the other keeps you away and sends you to hell. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Pride is giving God what he doesn't deserve. I didn't make a slide of that, but I wish I had. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, but pride is giving God back what he does not deserve. God does not deserve our pride. But the Bible says he gives grace to the humble. It isn't as if our humility earns the grace of God. That's not what I'm saying. Humility merely puts me in a position to receive the gift of grace. I can't earn grace. So being humble doesn't give me grace, but being humble, I may be able to receive that grace. Verse 7 now, my friends. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Good job. To solve the problems of carnality and the strife it causes, we must also resist the temptation of the devil. This means to stand against the devil's deceptions and his efforts to intimidate us. As we resist the devil, we are promised that he will flee from you. My friends, this is a promise. There is a window of opportunity that God gives us when we resist the temptation. It doesn't open wide. It doesn't last long. But he gives you an escape route, my friends. For when you are tempted, you have an escape. 
But do we even recognize temptation anymore? Because the more we become complacent, the more that we become compromised in our doctrine, in our theology, in our worldview, we do not recognize the devil's schemes of lust, greed, power, and pride. Because we have seared our consciences to the point where we do not recognize that we are becoming prideful, lustful, greedy, power-driven, and selfish people. Oh, sure, we can notice it in other people. Andrew Murray said, the truth is, pride must die in you or nothing like heaven can live in you. Andrew Murray is a wonderful author. He said, the truth is, pride must die or heaven can't live in you. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So we're told to resist the devil. Resist temptation. Now, the word resist is important, right? It means to hold back. That's what I thought, to resist an evil person or to resist a temptation. It's almost like putting my hands up. It comes from two Greek words, stand and against. To resist means to stand against. James tells us to stand against the devil. Don't sit. Don't be distracted. Look him in the eye. Point him in the face and resist him. Satan can be set running by the resistance of the lowliest believer who comes in the authority of what Jesus did on the cross, my friends. It is the power of Christ that you can resist the temptations of this world. It is not your power. Think back to when you were a natural man before you were saved, my friends. Sin didn't bother you. It was part of your life. Maybe you felt a little remorse, this godly, it uh, wasn't, God, wasn't godly sorrow, it was worldly sorrow, and you felt bad, and you might even ask for forgiveness, but it wasn't meaningful, and it wasn't life-changing. Because when you draw near to God, He will draw near to you. The call to draw near to God is both an invitation and it's a promise. It is no good to submit to God's authority and to resist the devil's attacks without drawing near to God. We have it as a promise that God will draw near to us if we draw near to Him. If we don't draw near to Him, why would He draw near to us? So I just have another slide here, and we're going to close in a minute. What does it mean to draw near to God? Come on up, Beth. Spurgeon considered a few different ways, and I think it's there, yeah. What does it mean to draw near to God? It means to draw near in worship, praise, and prayer. This is often corporate worship. I love it when you come to church. Some of you walk in here happy as a clam. I see you looking for your friends, getting your coffee and your muffin laughing with people in the lobby. You want to come in to praise and worship and pray. You want to hear the word of God and see how you can be changed. And then I see people come in on Sunday morning as well, and I want to speak about them for a moment. They come in a little different than you do. They come in a little slower. They come in a little more careful. It's almost as if the Spirit of God is dragging along their body. You know what I'm talking about. They're going through chemo treatments. They've been through cancer battles. They need a hip replacement. Sometimes they have a walker and they need a little extra care. They need someone to hold the door for them and we have that for them. And they aren't going to miss their blessing, my friends. They don't spend a lot of time in the lobby because they can't stand very long. But they can't wait to get into the sanctuary. 
sit on a soft padded pew, get to raise their hands for worship. Oh, if we could all be like that. Would you remember them next time you have a headache and think about staying home? Would you remember them when you think about the fact that you've been busy the day before and you deserve to sleep in once in a while? Would you remember them, my friends, when you start to think that maybe you don't have to go to church every week? You miss out on such a great blessing when you're not here. I come here to receive a blessing. I come here anticipating a blessing. Draw near to him in worship, praise, and prayer. Often this is in corporate worship. It means to draw near by asking counsel of God. Go to God before you go to your friends. My wife has a lot of wisdom, and I have a few friends with a lot of wisdom, and they intercede for me. They help me. One of them is here today. Pastor Alan Summers, my best friend. But I can tell you one thing. I always go to God before I go to Alan. Ask for counsel. It means to draw near and enjoy communion with God. And I just have a, a note here. Enjoy your prayer time. God, I got five minutes for you, and then I'm going to spend but the next 30 minutes on Facebook, so I got to make this quick. In fact, I'm going to set my timer just to make sure when the alarm goes off, we got to be finished. Ready? Go. That's not enjoying the presence of God. What I want you to do is just to relax. Empty yourself of yourself. And just pray whatever is on your heart, my friends. Facebook will be there later. Your friends will be there later. Dinner can be cooked later. My friends, just enjoy practicing the presence of God the way Brother Lawrence wrote in his little book. Some of us just need a posture of prayer. We just need to remember that communion with God is the most important thing we can do. It's why we were created. And it doesn't happen in the sanctuary all the time. It happens in your living room. It happens in your car. It happens in your bedroom. It can happen wherever you're at. It means to draw near in the general course and tenor of your life. Because the more time you spend with God, the more we know you spent time with God. I heard uh, someone say one time, for the pastor to be mighty in the pulpit, he needs to be mighty in prayer. I think it was E.M. Bounds, one of my favorite writers on prayer. For the pastor to be mighty in the pulpit, he needs to be mighty in prayer. And I believe that to be true. See, it's so easy just for pastors to get up here and fake it and share stories, but they don't really have a conviction about it unless they have spent time with Jesus personally. And I know that there's some good preaching that comes from this pulpit, and I thank you for our retired pastors, and I thank you for our youth pastor, and I thank you for those that work hard on their messages. So I'm just going to close. Don't put any more slides up, my friends. I'm just going to close. We close with this. Verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. That's why I said when you spend time with Jesus, we know it. If you're skipping prayer times and you're skipping services, we know it. It shows in your lifestyle. You see, we begin to look a little bit more like the world and a little less like Jesus. Well, I'm busy on Wednesdays, Pastor. You don't know. I... Wednesday nights are my night, Pastor. I understand that. That's why I opened Thursday night up for you. Oh, but Thursday nights are my night, Pastor. Okay. Let's empty ourselves of us. Would you stand with me? Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Our altar workers are going to come forward and we're just going to ask you if you'd come forward too. Maybe the Lord has spoken to your heart today. I'm not saying this is a powerful message, but maybe something in God's word spoke to you. 
Maybe God is reminding you to go back to the things you used to do, the disciplines you used to practice, but you haven't in a long time. Maybe you haven't opened up your Bible in a couple weeks. It's time to say, God, I'm sorry. I'm going to come to the altar, and I'm going to, I'm going to humiliate myself if that's what it takes because I want to be humble because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And I know that everybody in this church will look up to me and think, he is a man of God. He wants to get it right. Nobody looks down at anybody at the altar. I always look up to them. I always thank God for them, and I thank you that people are already coming. And if the Lord is speaking to you to get something right in your life, or if you feel so called to come and pray with somebody, let's make it right this morning, my friends. Don't wait. The Lord is here this morning. The Lord wants time with you. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace. A little bit worldly. I've gotten away from prayer, and I've gotten away from reading your word, and I'm coming home. I'm coming back, Lord. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for those who have come forward to pray. Father, we know how easy it is to get distracted by the things of this world. And sin is always there, for there is always temptation, Lord. And every one of us feel encouraged today, challenged or convicted by your word, because we don't spend enough time with you, Lord. God, I pray that you would forgive us. But by prayer and by reading your word, Lord, and having communion with you, Lord, we can be strong in the Lord, resist the temptation of this world. Father, I pray that you would raise up an army of believers and Christians who want to be on the front line, who want to go to battle, Lord, for what you've called them to do to use their spiritual gifts, to join ministry teams at Park Place Church, to be here every Sunday because they know they can make it and they have put God first again in their lives. Father, for anyone who is struggling with a physical ailment, emotional, mental problems, financial problems, marital problems and grief, Father, I pray a special blessing upon them right now, Lord Jesus. For we are a needy people and we need you desperately, Lord. We come before you, we confess our sins, we praise you, and we lift up our prayer request to the glory of God. Thank you for this time together today, dear Lord. For you are good, you are kind, and you are loving, and you always take such good care of us, Lord. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Got one last slide. Can you put it up there for me? Please now receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day, my friends.